Welcome to the St. Sabina Adult Education Series. This is Session 1 of Sancro Sanctum Concilium, the Vatican II Constitution on Sacred Liturgy, facilitated by Biagio Maza, Pastoral Associate at St. Sabina's Parish. There were 16 documents passed by Vatican II, but most biblical scholars and theologians agree that the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy was the most significant. It was also the one that needed the least amount of revision and is a document against which all other documents from Vatican II are measured. In this five session course, Biagio takes a closer look at the Sacred Liturgy document, how it came to be, and the effect it has had on the Catholic Church over the past 50 years. Welcome. Uh, this is uh, uh, the first of uh, five sessions I'm hoping to do on. Uh, what I would call the most significant document that came out of the Second Vatican Council. At least that's what a lot of people are calling it these days, if you look at some of the scholars and things that are looking at it. Um, and this is the document on the liturgy. All right? And so um, what I'm actually going to do with you is walk through the document with you. And, and uh, so what I gave you in the packet is a, is a uh, the first chapter, which is probably the most significant chapter in the whole book, um, or in the whole document, uh, because it sets forth the principles. Come on in. Hey, Phil. That's all right. <laughs> Wait here. Uh, uh, so let's, um, uh, we're going to focus on, on, on this document, and especially the first, uh, the first uh, chapter of it. We're going to spend a couple of weeks on that first chapter just to unpack it. Just, uh, let's just do a little beginning of it. And here's what I'd like to do. I mean, just uh, let's start with your own experience, first of all, okay? Uh, think of the liturgy. Many of you, I don't know if many of you, but most of you could go back to 1960. <laughs> If you can't, uh, it's okay. <laughs> we forgive you. But if you went back to the liturgy previous to the Second Vatican Council, what would you say were some characteristics of that liturgy? What were some of the characteristics of that liturgy that you, from your personal experience? Yeah. Oh, a devotions being more important or took on a greater significance than the Mass. All right. Good, good. Priest with his back to the people, right. What else? Oh, communion rail, exactly, yeah. Very clearly a separation between what was going on in what they called the sanctuary, meaning the, the holy place. I always wondered, did that mean anybody outside the holy place was not holy? <laughs> but anyway, yeah, the, the clear division through that altar rail. What else? Okay, you didn't engage. It was, uh, as someone said, it was primarily a spectator sport. <laughs> uh, you, you basically sat there and you watched. Or you, uh, prayed your or you prayed your rosary. Or you did something to be engaged because the action was going on up there, but somehow or other you were not really connected to it. On top of the fact that it was in a language that most people by that time did not understand. And so, so we had that, that issue as well. What else? Good, yeah, no, no lay ministers whatsoever. Everything was absorbed into the priest and usually the one or two altar boys. I, I mean, uh, they represented the community. As a matter of fact, uh, traditionally, the altar boy actually did the responses for the community. So they could say, we did have community involvement, <laughs> even though you didn't know about it. <laughs> we did have community involvement. How did we do it? Through the representative of the little altar boys that were there responding to the, to the light prayers, right? Oh, okay, yeah, the covering of the heads, right? Yeah, the veils on the heads and so on. Yeah, that, that's a tradition. Yeah. Oh, a clean access, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We have more people receiving communion than when I was a kid. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. As a matter of fact, the traditional saying is, you know, more people... Uh, there were the lines for confession were longer than the lines for communion, <laughs> uh, and so yeah, less participation, less reception of, of the Eucharist. Also, the face-to-face uh, -face, uh, confession yeah. didn't exist, right? Yeah, I mean, it's much better than the old system of going in a dark little closet and 
And be careful which parish you belong to then. <laughs> because they're bringing them back. <laughs> like, ven like a vengeance, you know. Uh, when did girls start being altered, altered people? It was fairly, fairly recently, actually. No, 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 not really. No, 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 no. It was, I'd say, within the past, I'm trying to remember exactly when it came, but I'd say within the past 10, 20 years at the very most. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't that long ago because we still had a major controversy about whether girls could, uh, and a lot of the priests were objecting to it simply because uh, uh, the mindset was that boys, by having altar boys, that's how you generated candidates for the priesthood. If you had the altar girls, you know, and they started thinking about the priesthood, guess what? Yeah. Sorry. But they're angels. Uh, they're like little angels. Uh, uh, <laughs> that whole notion that the priest did the liturgy, right. not the people. Now, there's no denying we need a leader in the celebration, but the whole notion was this was not something that you did at all. This was something that the priest did. And the priest is the only one that had the power. That the priest is the only one that had sacred, consecrated hands and so on. The only one who could touch any of this stuff and so on. And so there was this massive, you know, separation between, uh, you know, the special class of people who could only, uh, that's why you'll, you'll get, I'm, I'm sorry, but this happens even to this very day. As a matter of fact, it's horrendous when, you know, you'll get the uh, newly ordained priests who've been taught in, some, some strange seminary somewhere, um, that uh, uh, if it wasn't for them, God would not be available to you. Because they are the vehicles through which God is made present. Whoa! And what do they teach about baptism? Well, see, everything... Uh, at the auxiliary bishop in New York when I was still there, I mean, that 25 years ago now, right? The auxiliary bishop of New York would come and do confirmations. Huh? And of course, what typically happened during confirmation is you spoke to the boys about their desire for priesthood. And then he would go on the priesthood for a, a good while, claiming that the most essential sacrament is ordination. Why? Because ordination, without ordination, there would be no Eucharist. Without Eucharist, there would be no church. Therefore, ordination is the most important sacrament. <laughs> now, even then I knew it was fairly sick logic. <laughs> but here's a bishop, a bishop who actually claimed that, that, and he would go, that's a consistent basis. First of all, what it did to the girls there at the beginning, but not even paying attention to them, I mean, just to the guys. And then this whole notion that uh, exactly that baptism wasn't really relevant. It was, and that's why, really, if you look at that, that is why this document was one of the most revolutionary documents, because it's the first document that turns that whole world upside down. The primary sacrament, the primary sacrament of ministry and connecting with God, is baptism, not ordination. <laughs> And it turned that whole world upside down. Uh, now, obviously, this bishop had never read Vatican II, or if he had, he didn't pay any attention to it <laughs> because he did his own thing along the way. Karen, you're here. I'm sorry. I remember when I was in grade school, Catholic school, and we had Mass every morning. And the sacrament of baptism was something that was really Yes, OK, good, good, yeah. Do I, do I pay attention to this one? Or right. Yeah, private masses, very much so in the side altars and all that, and you could be having, you know, five, six masses going on all at the same time, uh, and you really wonder, where was this? And if you recall, I don't know if you can recall this, it, it, it changed and it differed in different parts of the country. There was a period of time in which uh, communion, the reception of communion by the faithful was seen as a distraction to the movement of the liturgy. And therefore, what they did was they actually distributed communion before Mass or at the Mass. You could hang around at the Mass, but not during Mass. 
No, as a matter of fact, you know, there are major discussions of the bishops of the Council of Trent. You know, the Council of Trent ended in 1563. Major discussions about whether we should even allow people to come into the uh, celebration when the priest is saying Mass because uh, they really, you know, they really prove to be a distraction to the priest's action. They're a distraction. Now, thank God some of the other bishops said, now, wait a second, what's the purpose of the Mass? <laughs> but... That, that, just to think of how, how way off base it had gotten, uh, let's put it that way. And that's why it, it's fascinating to me that John the 23rd coming out of that experience, you know, Pope John the 23rd coming out of that experience in 1958 says, there's something wrong here. We've got to do something about, and his, his, the thrust, and, and it shows up in this document, with a rich, especially the, the beginning, the preface of this document, it shows up with the key purposes that he stressed for the council. And one of them was, you know, the engagement, the engagement of the whole people of God. I mean, if there's a theme running through this document throughout is that all of us are called to full conscious and active participation. And it's repeated in various ways throughout this document all over the place in terms of the kind of language that you use, how the rituals are supposed to be uh, put together in a way that engages people, um, that local, the, the local ordinaries, you know, the bishops of uh, certain uh, you know, areas could determine what's appropriate, what's the most appropriate language or translation for their people, right? Uh, so all uh, the way, the music, I mean, <laughs> I mean, we'll talk about it in a minute, but you know, <laughs> the two most controversial things when they were discussing this, two of the most controversial, there were about four or five of them. The one that created the most heated discussion, are you ready? One was the participation of the people in the singing of the hymns and mass. And the other one was the... Uh, the move from using Latin to using the vernacular. <laughs> those, those were two of the four or five most controversial topics. And it was really interesting to listen to the argument. Listen to the argument. Just one of the arguments. He meant it. went back and forth. But the argument with regards to music. This is giving you an idea. Why was there such opposition to the possibility of having the people engage in music? Because then we would put all the choirs out of business. Uh, first of all, and then, you know, the sacred patrimony of the church, the polyphony, the Gregorian chant would disappear and we'd be singing common ordinary song that some of the others could sing along with. <laughs> well, see, this is part of the other thing with, with this document is the cultural expression. People have a right to use what's speaking to them. Now, the problem is, in this particular case, is what's appropriate for the liturgy. Now, uh, you know, if you want to go into music, for example, I mean, this is what really is, when you don't know your history, it really can confuse things. You know that the first time that the organ was introduced into church? Hmm? Uh, roughly 1,200s or so, and it was condemned as a secular instrument not appropriate for worship. <laughs> yeah, not appropriate for worship. So, so, uh, but eventually, give it a couple centuries, and it becomes the only thing we can play. <laughs> you know, uh, look at what happened when the guitars were introduced. Oh my God, the hootenanny was coming into church. You know, and uh, all of a sudden, you know, n an instrument not appropriate for celebration, and so on and so on. So you got to look at your history and say. Uh, give it a few years and maybe who knows what may happen. Uh, but I think what, what is happening here is the, the, the cultural expression is another thing that we're paying attention to. But, I mean, when I go back to the arguments with regards to music, for example, uh, none of those arguments made sense because, see, what the council had to do is what are the principles around which liturgy configures itself? What are those key principles? And one of the key principles that they came up very clearly is this full conscious and active participation by all. As a matter of fact, I think I mentioned this to some of you maybe, but this would be an appropriate time to look at that because when the revision of the Missal of the Second Vatican Council began, 
till to this very day, at the very top, you know. Let's do the missile of the uh, um, a Trent, which ultimately got changed, but the missile that we were using before Vatican II said, at the very top, with regards, Mass begins when the priest is ready. Completely priest-centered, and he's the only one that's really important in this celebration. Uh, uh, if you go to the transition that occurred because of this document into the missile, you know, the missile was revised, into the missile of the Second Vatican Council, which came out and everybody had to use by 1970. Remember, the council was ended in 65, 1970. Uh, if you go into that introduction, when does Mass begin? It says... Huh? In the parking lot. In the parking lot. Yeah, yeah, good. <laughs> it literally say, it doesn't quite say that, but good paraphrase. <laughs> uh, mass begins when the people have gathered. Mass begins when the people have gathered. Meaning? Meaning what? What, what does that communicate? Yeah, the gathering of us, and that is mass, and see, this is a real theological problem. Is mass possible without the people gathering? No. Yeah, it couldn't be. I mean, you see that? I mean, without people there, there is no mass. Not then, you know, oh my God, what about all those private masses? Well, I mean, if you're going off that that's a key theological principle, you'd have to say, well, you know, now, Vatican II didn't condemn private masses, but they certainly discouraged them across the board to say, well, look, private mass is, you know, a mass by its very nature, liturgy by its very nature, engages all of us. And to do it in a closet somewhere by yourself doesn't, doesn't work. <laughs> That is not the purpose of the liturgy. Uh, but just realize, it's just a shift that occurred. You see that? From Mass begins when the priest is ready to Mass begins when the people have gathered. A whole community focus, a whole focus on all of us. All, and really, I mean, this is where the next, you know, several of the principles kick off. All of us, all of us celebrate. Does that mean in the gathering space, too, that's it. Parking lot. <laughs> yeah, that's what that's what Betty said. The parking lot. That, that, uh, well, yeah, it could be because it could be all of that. It could be you're getting up on Sunday morning to get ready to go to mass. All that's involved in that, and uh, it would be engaging in preparation for engaging in mass. For example, the possibility of reading the readings ahead of time. So that when you go there, you're more attuned to listening and paying attention and engaging. Uh, all that kind of stuff, you know. Uh, the, way, the way one, uh, the demeanor, the, the disposition that one has, all of that is part of the preparation for engaging in the liturgy. It's, it's yeah. all of that. You know, and this, is, this is the shift in the focus, too. And this is, uh, let me do a theological concern with you. If you look at... <coughs> the kind of focus that we had at Mass previous to the Second Vatican Council. And, and all of this is a component of that, you know. The, the focus that we had at the uh, Second Vatican Council, or previous to the Second Vatican Council, was on the liturgy as primarily focused on the death and sacrifice of Christ. Do you recall that? The primary is that this is an unbloody sacrifice. See, with that, that's what you learned in the Baltimore c Catechism, yeah. I'm bloody sacrificial. The primary focus, the primary focus was on the death of Christ, which led us into the typical mode of uh, Good Friday, where you contemplate this and what God has done for you and so on and so on. Fascinating, the shift that occurred with this document. As a matter of fact, it's in the very first paragraph, or, or after the preface, very first paragraph, where it starts talking about the the engagement in liturgy is the door for us into the paschal mystery of Christ. Through liturgy, we get into contact. We, we enter the door of the paschal mystery. So you'd have to ask, what is the paschal mystery? Can anybody in their own, what's, a pa what's the paschal mystery? Mm -hmm. 
First of all, let me ask you this. This word right here, before you even get to that one. <laughs> Mystery. Nobody knows. Uh, it's not nobody knows, but... Not leap of faith. Huh? Leap of faith. Yeah, it could be a leap of faith. But, you know, take it out of religion for a minute. When you think of the word mystery, what are you thinking of? Huh? A conundrum. A conundrum. Something people are trying to figure out, but don't seem to know how to get a handle on it. And not quite, a, a could be, yeah, it raises all sorts of issues that we don't know what the answers are, and so on, right? So, uh, a mystery by its very nature is something that we know something about. You know, we, we, you know, the Bermuda Triangle, we know things disappear. We don't know why. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, whatever, you know, uh, so things like that. So we have an idea, but we don't, we don't know exactly what the answer is or wh why this is happening. And so uh, when it comes to mystery, uh, wh what we try to do as human beings usually is we could just can't let it go. I mean, you know, my eighth grade nun used to say, you know, uh, listen, dearie, it's a mystery. Don't you worry your pretty little head about it. Just believe it, <laughs> Uh, especially when it came to talking about the Trinity and so on. But, 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 you know, mystery by its very nature is something that we human being constantly plumb the depths of, desire to plumb, try to understand, try to come to sense, even though at the very same time we will never be able to plumb all of the depths or understand it fully or completely. You see that? So that's what mystery is. Uh, so, uh, Paschal mystery refers to what, usually? Do you know? What would you say? Lamb of God. What? Well, it's certainly connected to the Lamb of God, yes. What else? Yes, right what? Yeah. Okay, Christ's triumph over death. A Paschal mystery is passion, death, and resurrection. I would say pre-Vatican II focus is primarily on this. Now you threw some of that in, but it's primarily here. This was a sacrifice, a bloody sacrifice on, uh, that we were going through. Um, Vatican II comes along and says, it isn't just this. This is important, but it's the whole picture. And uh, this, uh, this gives us the entry, the, the resurrection gives us the entry into this mystery that it isn't just a death experience. It's a death, and it's a path, and it's a journey that leads to new life. All right? Well, if you get that kind of a focus, then when we gather, we gather in hope and trust and confidence that God, in the person of Jesus, has already won the victory for us, and we celebrate that. Even, even though in our own brokenness we come with our own broken lives, our own worries, our own pains, and, and we bring that to the liturgy, and we know that being connected to the liturgy and the mystery that is the liturgy, it opens us the door to new life, new way, new meaning, new understanding of what life is all about. See that? So that's a significant shift in many ways uh, <clears throat> from the way we understood liturgy before to the way. Eileen? Well, Luther tended to focus more, Luther's issue was in, uh, that the victory has already been won for us. You see that? That's where, <clears throat> but uh, his focus was more, uh, so it's all uh, grace. In other words, you know, uh, we are sinners and we have to acknowledge our sinfulness, but the victory has already been won for us and God gifts us with that in the person of Jesus. We don't have to do anything to earn it. You see that? So that was, that was Luther's main problem. But yes, but he's focusing exactly on this, that through his passion, death, and resurrection, Jesus has won the victory. Yes, has won the victory and has gifted us with salvation. As a matter of fact, Luther, you know, he goes way off in this sense. Luther says that human beings, there's not one thing they can do to gain that, to earn that. It's a pure gift from God. And that's why he was taken on the good works, you remember, and then indulgences and all of that for this very reason. 
Uh, so yeah, <laughs> but yeah, you're right. I mean, the focus ultimately would have to be. It isn't just passion and death. Important as that is, that's why even in the Twitterum, it's resurrection that's really the key that gives us the key into the Paschal mystery. That this death, uh, uh, this um, the struggles that we have in life don't just stay there. They 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 become transformed into new life, new meaning. And that gives us hope filled. So when we go to celebration, it should be a celebration. And for human beings, what? We're receiving the resurrection Christ, and that union out of the water will fill us every day. I mean, it's just everything that I had grown up with and had embedded in my mind, that's what I'm going to That we receive the resurrected Christ. I mean, they got the risen. Yeah. Yeah. It's the risen Christ. Fully present, not, uh, not, the, uh, not the physical Christ who walked the earth, but it's the transformed, the risen Christ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, that the, uh, and, and there are a lot of Catholics who still don't understand that kind of an image, too. Uh, uh, but anyway, so the, the focus, therefore, when we come to liturgy, according to the Second Vatican Council, is we come to a celebration. We tap into that door that en enters us into the life of the resurrected. Christ. And sharing Eucharist, therefore, is exactly that. Sharing in the life already of the resurrected Christ, present and fully present in our midst, with the hope that we too, one day, will share fully in that resurrected life. That, see how the, all the, the dots connect <laughs> with regards to that? And so, what, how do human beings celebrate? <laughs> is it, that's, if this is a celebration, how do we as human beings celebrate? We use all the, <laughs> all the modes in which we celebrate. Uh, is there a time for private prayer? Of course, there's always time. As a matter, one of the engaging things in the liturgy is, you know, silence is part of it. But silence has its appropriate place as it does talking, as it does singing, as it does. Each, each, the celebration of the liturgy has those components in it. But to say automatically that every time I walk in that door and now you're in holy space and uh, somehow or other now you have to be silent or else God's not going to like you. It's not the way human beings celebrate. <laughs> yeah, this is what I'm trying to get at. You know? It's just not the way we celebrate. When they do that adoration, <coughs> thing, is that, that what you're talking about too? Uh, well, uh, <coughs> I'd, well, adoration is, is, adoration is different. Adoration is a devotion in this particular case, uh, separate from... I mean, there's nothing wrong with those kinds of devotions, benedictions, for example, adoration, you know. But when it comes to the, the gathering of the people, this is a celebration of the Paschal mystery, passion, death, and resurrection. And therefore, um, you know, um, whatever contributes overall to the celebration of the liturgy uh, as as a, as a joyful celebration. And I see what has happened, in, and the major argument that has happened in the past 20, 30 years, especially I've heard it, is that we've lost, see, <laughs> this is really, we've lost the sense of the Mass as a sacrifice, and we've gone into this hootenanny kind of a style for liturgy. And that's why you got some of these new guys that are being ordained uh, want to go back to focusing on this to such an extent where this is almost muted. The resurrection, the hopeful, is just muted. I mean, we just, we're going to go back to only certain songs are appropriate for liturgy. And this modern song, Hootenanny style, <laughs> they're not appropriate. And, and so it's really interesting when you see the arguments going back and forth. Right? Can we go back okay. as far as the black hole? I'm sorry? Are you trying to go back as far as the, as the black hole? Oh, God, yes. You know, some, some go back to that focus that, you know, and that's exactly, that's a, that's a very good example of this because <clears throat> by our very nature we said that the funeral liturgy is a celebration of a person's life and a person's union with God. <laughs> nah. You know, death is a time of judgment and you better get your act together, baby, because he's ready for you. He's got it all written down. And, uh, well. <laughs> and so, yeah, the, the fear and the trembling and the black would be an indication, you know, Black vestments, black paw, all of that. I mean, just. Yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, yeah, go ahead, sorry. Go ahead. As a child, we were sort of taught, like, you must attend Mass or you commit a sin. Right, yeah. A real negative approach. 
Mm-hmm. <coughs> Which leads to sort of the death. Yeah, it's a focus. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a judgment time. You know, your, your life is being judged ba based on whether you would, yeah, you participated, you attended Mass or not. Not even participated, just attended. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good, good. Uh, oh, did you have your hand up, Karen? Yeah. You know, the difference between the death focus uh -huh. and the resurrection focus is you are being silent. You invite people over to your house for a dinner party, but no one can talk until the food's on the table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, why have people come over if you're right. not going to talk? Right, right, yeah. Yeah, so it is. I mean, it's the dynamics of what it means to celebrate. And, and that's why, by the way, when they put the principles down here of what makes for an effective celebration, you begin to see that it, they looked at all the dimensions of a celebration, how people engage one another, the, the facing, the, 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 the conversation going on in a mutual dialogue, being able, that's why you had to go from this, you know, Ecum, uh, Dominus Vobiscum, well, he did turn around for Dominus Vobiscum, but, uh, but you went from this to this. Now you can engage the crowd. Now you can also, you know, you greet one another, uh, you, uh, sign a peace, uh, the, the singing, the responses, the silence together, the postures, getting up and getting down, all of that is part of the celebration and entering into that fully. Yeah, excuse me. All right. Um, <coughs> What I'd like to do, let, just look, before I give you a break, let's look at, <clears throat> I want to look at the uh, outline of this document, because I think this is very, by the way, thank you, Th this was very good. I hope this was helpful in trying to recapture where we came from and making connections with where we are. Frank, you had a hand up, yeah. Say, like <coughs> said, it's a dinner party. You invite people to your dinner party, so if you're not Catholic, you can't eat the Ah, <laughs> now you're bringing in a, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, you're right, you're right. <laughs> And that's uh, what's in your heart. right, yeah, yeah. But but if we were going to go strictly speaking by church rules and regulations, yeah, right. uh, you can't do that. I mean, and so <clears throat> so Frank is right. I mean, if this is if we're focused on a celebration to which all are welcomed, my God. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we won't go there, but with regards to this diocese. But if all are welcome, you can come in, but you can't go up to share in the food. Then we got some issues. And, and that's become a major problem with ecumenical relationship. And you'll see one of the primary aims of this document is ecumenical relationships. As a matter of fact, they went out of their way. I'll point out a few places where they went out of their way to make the ecumenical connection from the very first paragraph all the way throughout. You know, even when things like Christ is present in four ways when we celebrate the Eucharist. Christ is present, this is number seven of the document, we're gonna, that's one of the things we have to unpack, but Christ is present in the ministers who celebrate, Christ is present in the bread and wine, Christ is present in the people gathered, and Christ is present in the Word. Is that a mystery? Huh? Is that a mystery? Well, yeah, in a sense, you know, we, we're not quite sure how Christ is present, but we know that Christ is present. Uh, and it doesn't say, you know, 95% uh, in the bread and wine and only 2% in the people or whatever. It says... Christ is present in all of those things. Right? Nope. And, but, the, what, but what was really interesting is what was really interesting is the focus on the word. Christ is present in the word. It was an emphasis that previous to Vatican II was not there at all. As a matter of fact, Christ present in the people was not there either. But what's really important about Christ present in the word is the fact that it was a clear, clear connection with the whole ecumenical uh, dimension of the church. In other words, most Protestants, most Protestants were much more focused on the word than they were on the sacraments. And, and so, as a result, by the church affirming the fact that, that Christ is present in the word, what they were doing is they were reaching out in connection to our ecumenical brothers and sisters saying, you are on target when, <laughs> when you focus on the word of God in your celebration, Christ is present. He's present just like you are standing there. 
No, not quite. <laughs> I mean, I'm physically present to you. <laughs> but I'm, phys I'm physically present to you, but Christ is not physically present to you. Christ is, uh, as we say, it's sacramentally present uh, in, in, in sign and in word and in people. And, yeah. Right. <clears throat> he doesn't say if and not only that, he, yeah, he says very clear in the gospel, I'm not going to be with you. So, but I'm going to send you the power of the Spirit to be with you. All right? And through that, you will experience my presence with you. All right? Through the power of my Spirit, you will experience my presence within you. And so we're a Spirit-driven church, Spirit-present church. Right? All right. Um, but, but, but that focus on the ecumenical dimension, which is very much part of the very beginning, is just, it, they do that consistently. And so that's, you know, a lot of people have jumped off of some of that to say, well, how can then we then become one around Eucharist? Right? Uh, is there a different way of uh, talking about the presence of Christ that connects us to one another? And later on, when they'll do the document on the church, that's exactly what they're going to say. There are many elements in our common tradition that connect us as one. Uh, the word, uh, the belief in God, the baptism connects us. Uh, our own celebrations together, all of that connects us to one another as church. Right? So, I mean, there's a lot of things going on, which also connect with a lot of the documents. This is the end of session one, part one. To continue the session, please go back to the main menu and click on Session 1, Part 2.